so we'll talk about those later. Asher, nothing. Titan's Notch, nothing. Ah, Last Sky Castle. It has salt. We can see it has the salt icon there. And then if we go back to the building browser, we can see that resources have their own category. Resources are almost always just three levels of building, and by hovering over them, you can see what we get. So by building a clay pit, we would generate 50 ducats a turn, and we would also gain 20 kilnfuls worth of pottery. Now, the 20 units of pottery is important because when we do trade with other factions, that is what we are selling. So the more resources you have, the more money you can make. So as we level up those kilns from the clay pit to the pottery maker to the kilns, the amount of income this thing just generates increases and the amount of pottery it produces also goes up. Then after that, we have the basic military, advanced military, defense and infrastructure constructions. And these are fairly standard between villages and cities. The difference here, and this is an important distinction to know, is that villages, like the mines of Nanyang and Nanli, can only get to level 3. So all of the buildings, which are level 4 or 5, they can never build. They can't get that high. Only the cities can upgrade to a level 5, so only the cities can get this super advanced stuff. That is an important one to note. Uh, which also means that you want to think about, well, this building only goes up to level 3. Do I really want that in my capital? Because you are limited in the amount of building slots you can get. You can see here, you've got these little outlines. This means that Nangao, when fully upgraded to level 5, will have 8 building slots. So do we really want to waste a building slot on the Jade Barracks, for example, when we could build that in, say, the mines of Nanyan and still get the benefits? So every building that recruits units those units are available in that whole province not just the region the whole province so the mines of nanyang having a barracks means that we could recruit those soldiers in nangao so we probably eventually want to move the barracks to one of these two once we take them however we do have access to some higher level stuff so right now we already own the nangao forge this allows us to get the iron hail gunners if we upgrade our town center to a town uh, which will require two growth Two population surplus rather which we can see down here we'll talk about that in a minute then once we hit level three then the next tier of buildings become unlocked and we can build any of those as long as we have the previous buildings already built so right now at level two we have the nangao forge that's this guy right here it is providing us access to iron hell gunners and the units which are shown the unit cards which are shown on the side basically gives you a visual overview of what you can access from those buildings so if we were to build the corral it would give us access to peasant horsemen, and we could start recruiting those here. I did rename this Sky Junk, yes. Um, so right now we have access to the Iron Hell Gunners, which are basically shotguns. If we got to level 3, we could then choose to upgrade to the Powder Magazine, and we could get access to the Crane Guns and the Grand Cannon. That's when our artillery really starts to shine. And then if we got to level 4 and then built the Fire Rain Silo, we can get Fire Rain Rockets which are rocket launchers. And the nice thing about those guys is there are four of them in a unit instead of just one. They can really rain down fire upon their enemies. The name is appropriate. Um, so you want to think about the composition. The infrastructure buildings are also another interesting one to note because for Cathay, infrastructure buildings are listed as being yin or yang. We are very heavily in yin at the moment, so we may want to consider building some yang buildings. Now, generally these are categorized in sets of two. So you have these two, you have these two, and you have these two. You can build one or the other, one or the other, one or the other. They are mutually exclusive. So you want to be careful about what you choose. So we could get the Labour Conscription Bureau, which will give us growth. It will give us construction cost in this province. So again, that's all three of these towns. It will stop us building the tea parlor, but it will provide us with plus one yang, which moves us closer to harmony. Or we could build the tea parlor. This provides us with 10 growth. It provides plus two income from all buildings in this province. So again, all the buildings in our province will be worth 2% more. It'll stop us building the labor construction, labor construction bureau, but it will provide us with some yin. Then we have the wares market, which is we generate 50 ducats per turn and yang. Or we can get the spice market, which is 75 ducats per turn, and we will earn an extra 2% from trade. So this is kind of feeling like a bit of a no-brainer. But if we take a look at the top tier buildings, we can see that eventually actually the trade exchange overtakes the um, 
the Emporium in terms of money made. So the trade exchange will then start earning 300 ducats, whereas the Emporium would only be 225. But you still have plus 6 trade from trade. Plus 6% trade income, which is a faction wide. So any trade that you're doing throughout your entire faction will then start to increase its income by 6%. So I find it's usually a good idea to actually compare the top tier buildings instead of the bottom tier. So for the Ying, for the Yang Sanctuary, this would increase control by plus 5. It would also increase the recruit rank for any recruited peasant long spears and peasant archers and provide Yang. Now, the downside of this is you're probably late game wise not going to be recruiting peasant long spears and peasant archers. You'll rather get the Jade Warriors. Um, but the op opposite choice is the Yin Lodge, which increases control by 3, so it has less of a control impact. But it does increase casualty replenishment by 9%, which means that units in this province, and I think local armies does mean province, not region, um, would have their hit points restored 9% faster than otherwise. And recruitment cost for peasant long spears and peasant archers is 80% cheaper. So you can either have them be better or be cheaper. Um, so do we want to build one of those? Maybe. Another option is defenses. We can choose to put up walls. Now, Cathay is again unique in that there are two lines of defense. And these are, again, mutually exclusive. So you can go for the artillery batteries line, which is Yang related. And I will tell you now, Yang tends to be close combat. So you'll get Jade Warriors, Peasant Long Spears, Halberds, Celestial Dragon Guard. And then also one unit of archers, one unit of crossbows and Jade Lancers, which are cavalry. Or you can go for the Sky Lantern Roosts. This will provide you with two Peasant Long Spears, two Peasant Archers, two Crossbows, one Celestial Dragon Crossbow. So basically, very little close combat and lots and lots of range. It's also Yin Harmony. The Tower Projectiles will be upgraded, so your towers will do more damage, but those are equal, as are the Defense Supplies. So this is purely about the Garrison that you will get. And the Garrisons are important because every region, so every city or village will have a garrison so if we click on this button here this is garrison details it will show you what units are here so just like your army has different units in it garrisons also have different units and this is determined by your capital city the the, the capital of the region you can see it provides a garrison the higher the level the city the bigger the garrison and then also some buildings will provide garrison so for example the ramparts or the archer platforms which are the defensive structures will also provide a garrison so because we are again yin, we may want to consider going towards the artillery batteries to give us some more yang. But for now, I like money, I like trade, I think we're going to go with the clay pit. And we're going to go with that. So there we go. So we are now building that, it's going to take us two turns. This next building slot is locked, and it will be locked until we get to the level 3 town. Now, how do we upgrade the town itself, you ask? Well, that is done through growth, which you can see down here. So every turn, this province again this is another provincial thing will generate 23 growth 20 from buildings and then three from the wujing compass earning us 23 total every time we hit 125 that growth will become a population surplus and i think the surplus will increase or the growth needed for surplus will increase the higher surplus you have and we're going to need two points of surplus which we can see here to upgrade to this so we're going to need both 4,000 ducats and two surplus so it's going to be several turns we can do that we can get to level one in six turns then it's probably another six to eight turns after that to hit level two so we're a ways away from being able to upgrade so actually if we cancel the clay pit what we could do is go for one of the growth buildings and this is a yang line it reduces the construction cost a lot of these high tier buildings are very expensive we're going to build them here this is the capital so you know what let's actually go for the Labour Construction Bureau. It'll make all those buildings cheaper in the long run, and it will provide us more growth, which means we can upgrade our cities faster. Uh, cities and villages, rather, because, again, shared. The other thing here to note is income. So our province, again, it's a provincial thing, is earning us 150 income. <clears throat> all of it's coming from Nangao. You can turn off collect income if you are having control problems. Basically, this is saying we're not collecting taxes anymore, and control will get better. Then if we hover over the control, we can see that it scales. And we can see that we're currently right in the middle, zero. And you can see that by hovering over the skull. But it's going down by nine. We have poor harmony because we're very yin orientated right now. So we're losing six harmony from that. We're losing four harmony from the collected taxes. If we turn that off, then that loss goes down. We are losing two from the difficulty level because we're playing on a hard campaign 
two is just automatically lost. If you're on normal, it should be zero. If you're on easy, then you gain plus two, plus four, something like that. And this is a sliding scale. So the worse our control, if we go all the way down to weak, for example, campaign line of sight for settlements become blind. They get no early warning of attacks. Their growth is massively reduced by 20. Control go up. It will try to auto um, stabilize itself. It'll trend towards zero. If you're at the high end of control, it will trend towards zero. If you're at the low end of control, it will trend towards zero. Uh, but all the units in that region become 15% more expensive. Conversely, if we have really high control, then our campaign line of sight for the settlements will be increased. So we get early warning for attacks. Growth goes up by 25%. Recruitment cost goes down by 5% for all armies recruited in this province. However, control goes down by 8 again because it's trying to self balance itself back down to zero and that's pretty standard among the different factions we then have uh, corruption just below that and we can see the corruption values for each of the different factions so right now because uh meow ying reduces corruption everywhere by minus two we have no corruption and it is in fact going down by a further minus two everywhere so it would need to be at least plus two to even start going up and then finally we have province effects but currently we have none that would be where things like the edict would go and you can see all of that information similarly on this panel over here it's, it's identical uh, so we have another notification. This is basically saying, hey, Wujing Compass, you haven't done anything that with that yet. So this is one of the special faction mechanics for Cathay. And it is not actually available yet. In three turns time, we'll be able to choose where the compass will point. But at the moment, uh, the choices are the Great Bastion. And because we have some stored up power here we're gaining defensive supplies and casualty replenishment uh, just because of the energy stored we have a little bit of celestial lake which means growth is going up by plus three in every region in Cathay and we're gaining plus two control in every region of Cathay because of the dragon emperor's wrath in three turns time we'll be able to start focusing the compass in one of four directions and we get this active bonus as well so for example if we go to the great bastion then threat level will start going up slower. We'll talk about that in a minute because that's an uh, important point. Recruitment becomes cheaper and we get the Celestial Intervention. If we go Celestial Lake, then we get more income and uh, Winter Magic will grow stronger. If we go to the Dragon Emperor's Wrath, then we will start to inflict attrition to anyone who's already on our side of the wall. And we can point it towards the Warpstone Desert, which is going to reduce Winter Magic. So it will weaken the power of our magic in our areas. It'll reduce enemy leadership as they get a bit panicked by the fact that magic is all disappearing. And it will also reduce corruption. This is the main point of the Warpstone Desert. Uh, it will massively reduce corruption in every region in Cathay. But right now we can't actually interact with that, so that is irrelevant. The Lord. Ah, caravans, right. So we have the caravan system. And the caravan system is chosen by this road here. Uh, this we icon here, the Ivory Road. So we'll click on you. And then this will give us a zoomed out map of the entire game world. So right now we are up here in Nangao. That's the the, uh, the the capital. Sorry. Wait, did it go from there? That's changed. Where's that going from? It used to be that they all went from Nangao. A to so it's going from the Tower of Asher now? Well, regardless, doesn't really matter. No, it's going from up there. Shanyang. Okay, so all of the caravans are going from Shanyang, which I think is actually Zhu, uh, Zhu Ming's capital. Which makes more sense, because he's the caravan guy. It was always weird. Like, playing as um, Zhu Ming, they would go from Nangao, and it made no sense to me. But if they go from there, then fine. So, we currently have one caravan in reserve. So, we have this Zhi Jin caravan. And if we click on him, we can see that he has an army. So it consists of him, consists of two units of jade warriors with halberds, two units of peasant long spears, two units of peasant archers, and rather nicely, two units of grand cannon. If he gets intercepted, because he is going to be on the main campaign map, then this is what he will be fighting with. Interceptions can either be physical armies going, don't like you, I'm going to attack you, or also events. He may get like an ambush or bandits blocking the road and then you have to fight the bandits. This is what he would be fighting with. But right now, we need to choose where we want to send him to. So we can go to um, this settlement down here. Is there a way of seeing what it is? You have to click on it. So we can either go to the Frozen Landing. We can go to Novchozy. We can go to Castle Drakenhof in Sylvania. We can go to Erengrad in Kislev. We can go Altdorf in the Empire. Or Marienburg. 
which is the end of the line. Uh, alternatively, we could go down towards where the Lizardmen are down in the Shattered Stone Bay. And then these ones are basically just picking a route. Those are not as relevant right now. We are interested in where we can make the most money. So I think right now, just because it's the early game, we want to go somewhere fairly close. So this is going to take us a total of five turns. You click on the flags to basically set your location. That's going to be six turns. We'll just go for the five turns. And we can choose how much cargo. Generally, there's no real reason not to go with a full set. Uh, caravans do tend to arrive, at least in my experience so far. So we'll send in a thousand ducats. That thousand ducats will then be converted into 3,199 when it arrives in five turns time. It is a great way of making money. The other thing I want to do is rename this guy. Because I like naming things after subscribers. This is going to be... Blue... Kiwi. And if we right click on the Caravan Master, the Caravan Master is similar to the heroes and the lords in that they have their own skill tree. This is actually kind of the secret of why caravans are so good, because you can customize your caravans as well. And then the armies that they gain will also be dependent on the caravan master. So if we again go to you, we can see here that you are a former artillery officer. That is the first under the traits. This lord's caravan has additional artillery units. That's the two grand cannon. And it has... 20% uh, more ammo for missile units. So a similar trait to what uh, Miao Ying has for her army. So this guy is going to be very much about ranged domination and being a Cathay with good artillery. That's a pretty good thing. You can choose to recruit more caravans if you want. You can only have one active caravan at a time. So there's not really any point, and I want to say this, to having more than two caravans. You can get more reserves if you want to, and you can recruit more caravans by pressing this. You'll be able to see who the person is, you'll see how much you'll have to pay them, and then you'll see their traits. So this guy is clandestine, which means that he's going to generate more experience for his units. They all start at a higher rank, and you can see that from the chevrons uh, around the unit cards. But he doesn't have any particularly special units, so no artillery for example. Um, but we're not really interested in getting a second person, so we'll just go ahead and close that. Go back to this, and then we're going to click on the frozen landing, increase the amount of money, and then we're just going to hit dispatch. And then from then on, it is basically automated. We'll see that the caravan is now here. Uh, where is he? We saw upon triumphant wings. I see it does go from Nangao. Thought so. So we can see here the caravan there. We have no control over him. That's all going to be automated. We can see he's a caravan from the icon. And every turn he'll just move further along the path. Double the practice drills. As another faction, can you attack caravans? Yes. And in fact, that is an important thing that I should have Commander mentioned. You can see on this map with the crossed swords how safe different areas are. If there's a red cross sword, there is a high chance of somebody intercepting you, either your diplomatic enemies or bandits or something like that. This is a dangerous route to be passing through. If you get an alliance with the nations along that section of the route, or you own the territories yourself, then this is going to become a safe passage and you can't be attacked there. So you can only be intercepted in the medium or high threat areas. So there is a high chance it will have a um, negative event coming through here because Shanyang and the towns here are owned by the dissenter lords of Jin Shen, the, uh, the rebels that we're fighting. Okay, I think we are actually ready after mere two hours to end our first turn. So right now we have the hourglass active. We can click that, although before we do that, actually. Let's check our diplomacy. So we're going to take a look at diplomacy. We click on the diplomacy icon, and then we get the zoomed out view with all of the factions that we know of. Now, this is only the people we know of. We haven't found everyone yet, and if we haven't found them, they're not on this list. So at the moment, we can see who our treaties are. So the Celestial Loyalists. These are the northern realm over here, I think. Um, they are currently non-aggression pact. They're also pretty friendly. They have good relations. Now we're going to click on quick deal. And this will basically highlight all of the deals that we can make right now. So we could make a non-aggression pact to the Imperial Wardens. The Imperial Wardens are another Cathayan faction. They are friendly towards us. And you know what? I like having friends. So we're going to go ahead and send them an offer of a non-aggression pact. So we're going to go ahead and start initiating diplomacy. And we can see I that it's already populated. Now... 
The chance of them accepting is these green icons here. So we could also say, you know what, I fancy having a trade agreement with you. And they are going to accept that. You can see the balance there. We could also say, you know what, I want military access with you as well. We're really going to bind them closely, diplomatically. They will accept that 1.4. Excellent. Then we can make use of this balance often button, where they will basically pay us to bring this down as close to zero as possible. And you can use that to balance in the opposite direction as well. As long as this is above zero, they will accept. If it's below zero, they never will. Um, but yeah, the Imperial Wardens really like us. They are happy to give us the trade agreements. We can see that we're going to earn 56 ducats per turn from them. And they're going to earn 56 ducats per turn from us. Once we start getting more resources, like the clay, then the share of money that we earn will increase based on those resources. And you can see here what the tariffs are. Uh, but this looks like a good deal. We're going to go ahead and propose Long that. Live, They've accepted. So we now have a non-aggression pact, a trade route, and also a military access through the Imperial Wardens. Now that we've got those, new abilities or new treaties have become available. So we can have a defensive alliance, a military alliance, or finally confederation. A defensive alliance is if somebody else declares war on them, then we can then we will automatically be called into that war. We could say no, but that would break the alliance. And generally you want to defend your allies. Uh, the other one is military alliance. So if they attack somebody else, they can call you in as well. And then finally, there's the Confederation. Confederation is basically a way of merging their realm into yours. It is only generally applicable to people of your same faction. So having a Confederation with anyone in Grand Cathay is possible. This is part of the reason that diplomatically we want to make them as sweet towards us as possible. So as we expand, we'll become more powerful. Relations will also go up over time just because they will trend upwards. Then eventually we may unlock the Confederation. Then boom, we are just annex them. It's a good thing to aim for, especially as the Order factions. Uh, you can usually expand quite a bit doing that. Oh, then next up, we're going to take a look at the Lord trade uh, agreements. We can see here that the Celestial Loyalists are interested in a trade agreement, so we're going to have and open into our fair dealings with them, so we'll earn 57 ducats, so will they. They are interested in having a military access agreement, so we'll go ahead and click that as well, so we can now move through each other's territory without penalty. And we currently have a plus five in terms of the agreement, because this is a really, really strong one for us. So we're going to go ahead and balance this offer, and they're going to pay us 700 ducats just to sweeten the deal. This honors the Emperor. Just signing in, ready to point out, is usually a good thing to only do the things the game tells you to do in the first turn, so they're usually missions and rewards associated with steps. True, I'm jumping the gun a little bit here with the diplomacy. Generally, you only want to do this when it says, hey, make a diplomacy thing. But we'll get through that soon enough, it's fine. Tyrant. So, there we go. Diplomacy is done, we are starting to raise relations. The other no thing I want to point out is you can cut. see their attitude. So, for example, the Celestial Loyalists, with whom we just did all the deals, their relations are currently 25, but because of all the treaties, that is going to trend upwards now to 41. But the Dissenter Lords of Jin Shen don't like the fact that we're at war with them. So their attitude is going to go down from minus 90 to minus 111. I don't think there really is a cap to these numbers. It might go up to like minus 200 plus 200. Uh, I don't remember offhand. I feel like it can actually go beyond that. And uh, you can see everybody's relationship and they're trending with you. Through these, you can see their general allegiance in terms of what faction they are and then whether you have a trade agreement or not. So if you don't have a direct uh, trade route to their capital or you're at war with them, you can't trade with them, if you just don't have the relations, you don't currently have a trade agreement, then it's going to be greyed out. And if you do have a trade agreement, then it's going to be green. So if we go to the Western Provinces, for example, which is our brother Zhao Ming, we can go to Initiate for what Diplomacy. Am I and we can see that my he might accept a trade deal soon. It's currently on zero. If we paid him some money, if we paid him 400 ducats, then he would accept. We just press the, uh, the balance button there. So we could do that. But I think right now, our relations should be trending. No, they're trending downwards. But if we go and kill the Dissenter Lords of Jin Shen, they'll like us. Likewise, the Kurgan Warband. Oh, Kurgan Warband. Right, yeah. Important point. I Especially for Miao Ying. The, the Bastion. We can see up here the Great Bastion threat. This is the likelihood of a massive chaos invasion sparking off against the Bastion. It's basically this area will populate with armies and they will uh, try to destroy the gates from you. 
This will trend upwards towards 100%. Once it hits 100%, a fight will initiate. So right now, it is going up by 12% per turn. So we've got another eight turns or so before the next attack on the gates. So before then, we want to try and get the snake gate repaired, probably. Can you ally anyone like Kut Cathay, make friends with Slanesh, for example? Theoretically, yes, but some factions will just have an innate hatred towards you. So some factions just can't do diplomacy, like Beastmen generally can't do diplomacy unless you're like Corn or Slanesh, I think. Um, some will just not like you by default, like trying to make an agreement with Zinch, they're not going to do it. Trying to make an agreement with Skaven, unlikely to do it. Making an agreement with Vampires, unlikely to do it. Usually factions are either Order aligned or Chaos aligned. Order factions will tend to get on with the other Order factions. Chaos factions will tend to get on with the other Chaos factions. It is possible to break that. There are some which trend more towards neutrality. Like Skaven tends to be a bit more neutral. Vampires tend to be a bit more neutral. Um, and they will do deals with the two different sides if circumstances align. Like if, there are, if you have a mutual enemy, then maybe you can get an agreement. Though like a full alliance is unlikely. The other thing which I should talk about with alliances, actually, which is more of a Zhao Ming thing than a Miao Ying. Um, but if you get an alliance, a defensive alliance or a regular alliance, then you can start recruiting their units. So, for example, if as Cathay playing as Zhao Ming, you get an alliance with one of the Ogre Kingdoms, you can start recruiting Ogres. So that that's one of the draws of trying to actually broach good relations between factions rather than just within your own. So if I got an alliance with one of the other Cathayan factions, I can recruit Cathay units, but I can already do that. Anyway, now I think we're ready to end turn. So we've got this hourglass here. We're just going to go ahead and click it, and then we'll see a bunch of numbers changing up here, which is all the other factions taking their turn. I have a very powerful CPU, so it's going to be very quick. The speed of your own end turns may differ. And then enemy... Any hostile units we'll see it moving around. Backed with the right settings, neutral ones as well. So there's a Beastman Horde moving around. 